Good afternoon, everyone. This is Dr. David Sandberg. I'm the Director of Pediatric Neurosurgery at the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston and Children's Memorial Hermann Hospital. And we are about to begin our webinar on tethered spinal cord diagnosis and treatment. Just a, a word of warning for those of you who are watching, there's a, a mixture of physicians and families and others watching this. Some of the images are somewhat graphic, so just a warning about that. And the purpose of that is just to show you exactly what we do when we take care of children who have tethered spinal cord. And I think when we talk about the diagnosis of tethered spinal cord, it may give some of you a greater appreciation for what is actually going on if you can see intraoperative images. So I'm going to start just with a few definitions. The most common term that is seen in the lay press and is, is known to, to, to non-physicians is spina bifida. And spina bifida is a very broad term describing defects of the neural tube. The neural tube is what is present in utero before the spinal cord and brain are formed. And the most common form of spina bifida is spina bifida aperta. Aperta means open. And what we are referring, are referring to is open defects in which the spinal cord is actually sitting on the surface of the skin. And I'm going to show you a picture of that. And here's sort of a, a diagram in which we see bone is missing in the back, skin is missing in the back, and the nervous system, the spinal cord, is actually present. And I'll show you a picture of that. That is called a myelomeningocele, and it's a fluid-filled sac which contains neural elements. Spina bifida occulta, or closed neural tube defects, are defects in which the skin is actually present. And so you don't look at the spinal cord when you, when you meet the baby, when the baby is born. You look at skin, which is abnormal. And I'll show you some pictures of that. What that tends to signify, if that abnormal skin is present, is that there's probably a problem deep to the skin as well with either the overlying, underlying bones or with the spinal cord itself. And I'll show you some examples of that. So tethered cord syndrome, which is the topic of this talk, I think the most important thing is to understand exactly what that means. So the spinal cord, in the circumstances in which there's a tethered cord syndrome, is restrained by inelastic structures and is under tension. And as children grow, that tension can increase, which is why symptoms can increase throughout childhood in a child who has an untreated tethered spinal cord. So as the body grows, there are a variety of different presentations, the most common of which actually is the one I list last, which is back pain. So older children as they're growing can prevent with, present with severe back pain. They also can have all of these other findings listed here. They can have motor and sensory problems, difficulties with movement, difficulties with sensation in the lower extremities, increased reflexes, bowel or bladder incontinence, scoliosis, or foot deformities, and of course back pain, or a combination of these things. So here's an example of an open neural tube defect, a myelomeningocele. So what you're looking at is the spinal cord as a flat neural band, which should have closed into a tube and it's sitting right on the surface of the skin. So you can see why we want to operate on these children right when they're born, because if this spinal cord gets infected and it's exposed to the world of stool and urine and everything else a baby is exposed to, it can get infected, and that's meningitis, which can be quite serious. You can see normal skin on each side, above and below, near the buttocks, and you can see a band of arachnoid, which is a flimsy tissue next to the spinal cord, and then some abnormal skin next to the um, next to the lesion and we're actually going to show a video now just give me one minute to get the video in place showing a surgery for repair of a myelomeningocele so some of you who have a myelomeningocele will be seeing what you went through we're proceeding um, by opening the space between the spinal cord and the arachnoid, which is the flimsy tissue surrounding it. So here we go. We're separating 
the spinal cord, which is this flat band of tissue, circumferentially very carefully to make sure not to injure it because we treat it as live neural tissue. So you can see we're going all the way in a circle. And I think for some of you who have a tethered spinal cord, watching this may help understand why these patients who have this condition can get retethering later. So now the neural tissue is free. And now we're opening the dura. The dura is found next to the skin. The dura is the covering of the spinal cord. So we're opening the dura so that we can fold the dura and close it on top of the spinal cord. And we want to harvest as much dura as we possibly can. And here we are folding the dura on top of the spinal cord. And we've harvested as much dura as we can. And we close the dura to try to prevent a fluid leak. And here we are suturing that dura closed. So we close this in a multi-layered fashion. I apologize. We're having some technical difficulties with the video. And so we're going to move on to the next uh, slide. But basically what we do is we close the spinal cord with dura around it and then with muscle and, and soft tissue and then have a normal skin on top of it. But you can see that that spinal cord could become stuck to the dura despite our best attempts to avoid it. One thing we're doing here at Children's Memorial Herman Hospital, uh, we were the first in Texas to perform in utero repair of myelomeningocele. So basically, what you're looking at here is a uterus that has been exposed. And here's the fetus with a myelomeningocele that we have repaired. And there are some advantages of potentially doing the surgery in utero. Of course, there are risks. And that's a whole long discussion. Um, not for this video, um, but it's fascinating to be able to offer these surgeries uh, to our tiniest patients who are not even born yet. So closed neural tube defects, as opposed to the, the lesions that I mentioned previously, have skin which is present. Now the skin is not normal, and when you see a lesion like this in the midline of a child's back, and here you see a little lump with some abnormal skin, the patient is going to need imaging studies to try to determine why this lump is there and whether there's a connection to the spinal cord, which there almost often is. So what you see here, this baby had this MRI scan, which shows that the spinal cord ends much lower than it should. It should end between the first and second lumbar vertebral bodies up here, but it ends all the way down here, and there's a connection to some fat, which goes all the way up to the skin, as well as some fluid. Here's a baby who has what's called a capillary hemangioma, which can be present in many areas of the body. But when they're present in the midline of the spine, it often signifies there's an abnormality. So here's the MRI scan for this baby, whose spinal cord ends all the way down in the sacrum. Again, it should end all the way up here. And it's stuck to this fat. So you can imagine that as this baby grows, this spinal cord, instead of being freely floating within the spinal cord, within the spinal canal, excuse me, is under tension, and that's when the children can get symptoms. Another baby born with a fatty lump on the back, a lipoma. And again, lipomas can be present in many areas of the body and can be quite benign, but they also can be associated with a tethered spinal cord, particularly when they're found in the midline in a patient's back. So this little baby has this fat which corresponds with a little bit of fat under the skin, and the spinal cord is stuck to that fat. Again, a graphic picture, but this is what we see when we actually do these surgeries. So the head is up in this direction, and the feet are down in this direction, and we find this fat from the skin, and we carefully, of course, we're using monitoring techniques to monitor, 
the function of both sensory function and motor function in the nervous system as we do this, what we find is that here's the normal spinal cord. The spinal cord continues below. Here are some nerve roots. And here's some fat which comes all the way out to the skin and is stuck. So what we're going to do during the surgery is we're going to find a safe place where we can transect this fat so that the spinal cord is floating freely within the spinal canal as it's supposed to. <clears throat> Another example, this one is a little more subtle. In a, a young girl, a six-year-old, who presented with urinary incontinence, she could not control her urination, and she had this much more subtle little lump of fat and a little dimple on her back, which again corresponded to fat that was stuck to the spinal cord, which ended lower than it should. Now, some patients can prevent, present with, with pretty dramatic findings in their skin, such as tails. You know, we all have tails when we're, when we're, when we're a fetus in, in utero, which go away. But you can have a persistent tail, and this was in a three-month-old boy who had this tail, and that is a sign that there's a problem with the spinal cord as well. His spinal cord ended very low, again stuck to some fat at the bottom of the spinal canal. And what we see in this patient at surgery, we see the dura which is opened up. You can see these sutures holding the dura open. And we see that the spinal cord ends in this big lump of fat. So we stimulate the fat with a, a, with a probe to make sure that there's no nervous tissue within it, and then we safely cut it, and now you can see that the spinal cord is floating freely within the spinal canal. It's not stuck to this fat anymore. And so as the patient grows, the spinal cord is not going to be tethered, and the patient should not get progressive symptoms. You can see we leave a little bit of fat sometimes stuck to the, that's on the spinal cord because we don't want to injure the normal spinal cord. This is the area which controls bladder and bowel functions. So we don't want to injure that, of course. But this is a very, very small amount of fat, and this child should do fine with, no, with, with a very unlikely possibility of retethering. Sometimes the skin findings can be quite traumatic. In this baby, it literally looked like a basketball on top of the baby's back, and this was filled with fluid, as you can see on the MRI scan. And this is called a myelocystocele, where the spinal canal ends very low and opens up into a canal which has a lot of fluid in it, covered by normal skin. But the spinal cord is again stuck to the bottom of the spinal canal, and we untether it during the operation. And of course, we remove all this fluid and the excess skin. Another common finding is what's called hypertrichosis, or a hairy patch in the back. And when there's a hairy patch in the back, that is often a sign of what's called a split cord malformation, in which the spinal cord is actually split into two spinal cords. Really fascinating from an embryologic standpoint. And those split spinal cords can be stuck to a bony spicule, and often the spinal cord ends lower than it should. And here's an intraoperative image, again with the dura open. And here, instead of one spinal cord, the patient has two spinal cords. And there's a bony spicule in between, which we've removed. And the spinal cord is also ends lower than it should. You can see here, clearly, we've freed it up. We're holding up the bottom of the spinal cord and is now floating freely in the spinal canal, which will close and give lots of room to try to avoid retethering. I mentioned skin appendages, um, such as a sacral tail. You can also have a lump of fat, like in this patient, with a little appendage coming out of it. And sacral dimples can be quite common. Now, some sacral dimples don't signify a problem with spinal cord tethering. This baby, one has to spread the, the gluteal fold. In layman's terms, that would be the butt crack, essentially, um, to see it. And you see a little tiny dimple. Very often, that is benign and does not require a workup in terms of imaging studies. But other little dimples, particularly when they're above the gluteal fold, or when they have little skin findings, like this small capillary hemangioma and this little red dot around the opening, that can be concerning for a dermal sinus in which there's an opening from the skin which communicates all the way to the spinal cord. And I'll show you pictures of that. So here's an example of a baby with a little dimple above the gluteal fold, a glove above the buttocks, and that 
dimple corresponds to an opening, which I'm showing on the MRI scan, which leads directly to the spinal cord, which is low and stuck. So in surgery, what we do is we trace that tract all the way from the skin down to the dura. We open the dura, and what we see is that that tract is stuck to some fat, which is stuck to the spinal cord, and we untether the spinal cord. Here's a band of fat, which is stuck to the bottom of the spinal cord, and here we've cut it, and the spinal cord is again floating freely in the spinal canal. And you'll hear the term tight phylum terminality. That's when there's a band of tissue. The phylum terminality is a band of tissue which is stuck to the bottom of the spinal cord. When it's tight or thickened by fat, that can be one of the causes of spinal cord tethering. So how do we make the diagnosis of, spinal, of a spinal cord tethering? Well, first, the patients often, although not always, present with the skin findings that I mentioned. So the skin findings alert the parents that something's wrong or the pediatrician, and then they're referred for appropriate management. Some patients present with motor or sensory deficits, back pain, scoliosis, kyphosis, progressive curvature of the spine, either sideways or forward, and foot deformities. This is a patient who doesn't have normal sensation in the foot, so develops ulcers of the foot, and this is a patient with feet that are dramatically two different sizes, and that can be a common cause, excuse me, a finding associated with the tethered spinal cord. Sometimes they present with urologic abnormalities. Now, urologic abnormalities are difficult to assess clinically in infants. In an older child, they can describe what they're feeling as they try to urinate and cannot urinate. In a baby, you know, they're going to wet their diaper, but sometimes that doesn't mean that they're emptying their bladder completely. They might have, for example, 80 milliliters of urine in their bladder, and they can only empty 20, which makes for a wet diaper, but can lead to the possibility of urinary tract infections or other problems. So in older children and adults, you can get urinary tract infections, incontinence. You can also have frequency where you're urinating very frequently, urgency where you can't get to the bathroom on time, or bedwetting. Bowel incontinence is much rarer in isolation, but sometimes happens together with urologic incontinence. You need a much greater degree of affecting the sacral nerves um, to get bowel incontinence. So the management of tethered spinal cord. When a patient shows up in our office who has findings of a tethered spinal cord, there are several important things that we need to do. All patients require an MRI scan of the entire spine. MRI scans do not require any radiation. In young children, they may require sedation. And it's very important, at some centers, they'll image just the lumbar spine if there's a skin finding in the lumbar spine. And that's a mistake. The reason that's a mistake is because when you have one area of the spinal cord which is tethered, occasionally you'll find a second abnormality in a completely different region. So we've had patients who show up with a lumbar MRI scan. We image the rest of the spine, and we find that the spinal cord is not only tethered in the lumbar spine, but there's a fatty lipoma in the thoracic or cervical spine on occasion that tethers the spinal cord or a split spinal cord malformation, something that would require surgery as well. Patients should be referred to a pediatric urologist. We have outstanding pediatric urologists at Children's Memorial Hermann Hospital who we work very closely with, and we send them for a preoperative evaluation. Typically, they'll obtain a renal ultrasound to make sure the kidneys are normal and the urine is not backing up into the kidneys. That's called hydronephrosis, and to make sure the bladder is a normal size, and urodynamic studies in which the urologist does formal testing of the urinary function to make sure that the child can empty the bladder properly. We get baseline studies, and then the urologists follow the children postoperatively as well. And then, of course, referral to a pediatric neurosurgeon. We typically wait to perform surgery until about three months of age in newborns who are diagnosed with a tethered spinal cord. The reason for this is that the likelihood of them developing a progressive neurological problem within the first three months of life is very, very low. 
and the risks of surgery are decreased considerably if we wait until the baby's immune system is a little better development at, better developed and they're a little bit fatter and stronger and um, and the risks of anesthesia go down as well so in terms of outcomes after surgery for tethered spinal cord very often we see improvement or at least stabilization of motor and sensory function now it's important to have surgeries done early when a patient has neurological deficits. The reason is, is that improvement is less common actually than stabilization. Only about 30% of patients actually get improvement in motor function or sensory function. And so we want to do these surgeries before the patients have a problem. And one thing that is, that is tough sometimes for parents to understand is that some patients who have a tethered spinal cord radiographically on imaging studies will actually never have symptoms of a tethered spinal cord and might go their whole life without any symptoms at all. And so the question in these patients is why do surgery at all? The answer is that if you're at a center that performs these surgeries routinely and has a low complication rate, the risks of surgery are actually much less than the risks of the natural history of the disease. And if you wait until a patient has a foot that turns in or has bowel or bladder problems, unfortunately, sometimes it's too late to reverse those problems. So very often when a patient presents with back pain that's associated with spinal cord tethering, the surgeries are very successful in decreasing that back pain. And the back pain can be quite debilitating. Some of our most grateful patients or patients who do not have neurological problems or problems urinating, but just are in such severe pain that they can't sleep, that they can't function, and you untether their spinal cord and they have instant relief. Improvement of bladder dysfunction, again, in only 20 to 30 percent of patients, we can stabilize bladder dysfunction, but improvement is not that common. So you really want to operate on children before they have significant bladder dysfunction once the diagnosis is made. Stabilization or even sometimes reversal of progressive scoliosis can be seen after surgery. Possible decreased progression of foot deformities. Of course, with any surgery, there are potential complications, which we try to minimize, of course, with our advanced neurophysiologic monitoring techniques in surgery, in which we monitor the function of the motor system, of the sensory system, and we also monitor the function of bowel and bladder um, roots, nerve roots, so that we try to minimize problems postoperatively. So neurological deficits should be rare. Urinary dysfunction can happen. Very often when it does happen, it's temporary. Rarely is it permanent. And um, luckily, in the overwhelming majority of patients, it doesn't happen at all. CSF leak. CSF is cerebrospinal fluid, which is the fluid which bathes the brain and spinal cord. It happens very rare, rarely at centers like ours that do these surgeries routinely because we just know how to close the wounds very meticulously um, to try to prevent these problems. And we keep patients flat after surgery for several days so that there's not a fluid column with pressure on our wound. And that usually prevents a fluid leak. When there is a fluid leak, very, very occasionally a patient will require a few extra sutures at the bedside or even a return to the operating room. So this is very important because some of you may have had surgery or have family members who have had surgery for a tethered spinal cord. And one of the most common questions that I'm asked is what is the chance that this is going to happen again? The answer to that is that it's not perfectly defined in the medical literature because there are so many different types of tethered spinal cords. I've showed pictures of very different conditions. It's as high as 10% when there's fat that's stuck to the spinal cord. Should be relatively rare if there's just a tight phylum terminality. <clears throat> the symptoms to look out for are the same, same symptoms that the patient originally presented with, namely back pain, motor or sensory problems, foot deformities, urologic abnormalities, etc. <clears throat> I show this picture of a 27-year-old who I actually met while on a neurosurgery medical mission to Guatemala a number of years ago when we went down and took a team and performed about 
15 or 20 of these surgeries on children with tethered spinal cords who didn't have the opportunities that, that the families have who we take care of in the United States to get care. This was a 27-year-old man who re basically reminded me why we try to do these surgeries when patients are young. He limped into the clinic, um, could barely walk. He had very, very severe scoliosis, curvature of the back. He was in excruciating pain with every step. He had complete incontinence of bowel and bladder function. And this is all because this 27-year-old man did not have the opportunity to have the surgery as a baby. And when he was a baby, by report of his mother who came with him, he was totally fine. He just had this lump of, of fat on the back and the parents couldn't afford to get it surgically taken care of in Guatemala. But as his childhood progressed, he kept getting more and more problems, but unfortunately, sadly, did not have the means to take care of this. So we count ourselves lucky that our children have access to these modern surgeries that can take care of this problem in a timely fashion. So concluding thoughts on tethered spinal cord, and then of course I'd be happy to answer any questions that anyone might have. Spinal cord tethering can be caused by a wide variety of pathologies with a wide range of neurological outcomes, but most patients do very well, particularly if this condition is treated in a timely fashion. Surgery can decrease back pain and can prevent progression of neurological problems. New symptoms such as weakness, sensory changes, bowel or bladder problems, or back pain may signify retethering of the spinal cord, which may require a second operation. Now, you know, we try to be very, very cautious about recommending a second surgery because with each surgery, the risks are higher. The spinal cord can become very stuck and very scarred to the overlying tissues after initial surgery. And so despite our monitoring techniques, the risks of a re-tethering, re-untethering operation are higher than the first operation. And so, you know, when a patient comes to our office with symptoms of re-tethering, we try very hard not to do surgery unless the patient is clearly symptomatic. And of course, we'll offer surgery if the patients are, are clearly symptomatic and we believe that the risks of surgery are outweighed by the benefits. Thank you very much for your attention. <clears throat> and I'd be very happy to answer any questions that anyone might have. And I'm just going to start by opening questions. The first question is from Jessica. And the question is, my daughter is one year old and is having a tethered cord release done in March. I'm concerned about infection since the incision site will be so close to her bottom. She frequently messes her diaper up to her back. Are there any preventative measures that we can take? <clears throat> and the answer to that question is the infection rate, thankfully, is actually very low. We take great care with our patients while they're in the hospital to avoid exposure of the incision to stool and to other contaminants. And basically, the way we do it is we cut out the back of the diaper so that, excuse me, so that the contents of the diaper don't touch the incision. So you can see the entire incision at all, that, at all times. We keep the back of the diaper open for a few weeks after surgery. So the parents are instructed to frequently change the diapers, keep the back of the diaper open so that we can see the entire wound, to clean the wound frequently, and doing those measures, the, the, the infection rate is very, very low. We sometimes, for babies that, that have, particularly young babies who have frequent stools, we sometimes even put a colostomy bag, a bag that goes over colostomy sites in the abdomen, over the anus to collect stool and keep it off our incision. We're very serious about this. And usually, the infection rates are extremely low with this procedure. So answering the next question, um, I'm being asked, how can we make an appointment uh, to see you if our child has a tethered spinal cord? Our office number is 832-325-7242. At this moment, uh, there don't seem to be any additional questions. I will, oh, here comes a question that we will answer. And this is from Camille. Do other health issues occur 
in adulthood? <clears throat> and the answer is adults can actually present with tethered spinal cords. And sometimes this is first recognized in adults who present with severe back pain, um, which sometimes is blown off and then lo and behold they get an MRI scan and they have a tethered spinal cord and surgery can help those patients as well. As tethering persists, symptoms tend to get worse going through childhood into, into adulthood. And they're the same symptoms that I listed in children that are associated with tethered spinal cord. I'm a pediatric neurosurgeon and I don't take care of adults generally, but occasionally we're asked to take care of adults who have a tethered spinal cord who are referred by adult neurosurgeons just because this is a more common condition seen in children. So for the more challenging tethered spinal cords, occasionally we will operate on an adult who has this problem. Another question coming in from Crystal. My son is five years old and his first tethered cord release <clears throat> was when he was six months old. His left leg is turning in and he is showing major behavior changes. Bowel and bladder changes as well, but they are not regular. So my comment would be that tethering, retethering can occur at any time. Usually it occurs a little bit later, more like when patients become teenagers and have major growth spurts. But if there's a new problem with your son's leg turning in or with bowel and bladder changes particularly, there's no question that he needs to be evaluated for retethering. And I think the things that need to happen are he needs a new MRI scan of the total spine if he has not had one already in, in, you know, in recent months, and he needs a referral to a pediatric urologist as well to formally evaluate his bladder function. And then based upon his clinical examination and the results of these tests, he may or may not require another procedure. I think we have no more questions at this time. So I would like to thank those of you who joined us for this webinar, and I hope you all have a great day. Thank you.